Good morning. Would you stand with us? We want to sing this morning. Glad you're here. Glad you're thawed out. <clears throat> Glad to have you about uh, here. No frozen pipes. So I want you to use your pipes this morning to sing as we uh, share together. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost when he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free. Tell somebody that this morning as you greet them in the name of the Lord, that I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Yes, you are. Wait, I am too. Oh, good.
We're glad you're here this morning. If you find your seat, we'll uh, continue in our service this morning. It's good to, uh, good to share, good to have some fellowship, good to chat face-to-face <clears throat> instead of online. So it's good to be able to, uh, to share together. Uh, at the end of each row, there's a little slip of paper called the People of Elk Missionary Church. If you would fill that out, I would appreciate that and uh, certainly enjoy uh, praying with you if you have any prayer requests. A uh, couple of things I wanted to... Uh, <clears throat> there are still some uh, annual report journals on the back table, uh, and these are the corrected ones. So someone approached me last week and said, Pastor Corliss... You've been a little careless because the trustees are carless. All right, I'm going to try that again. Some of you, someone said to me, Pastor Corliss, you're a little careless because the trustees are carless. Okay, okay. for those of you that don't get it, um, Talk to somebody who did. So, any, <laughs> there are a few of those on the back table. We want you to uh, make sure you have those. Uh, just gives a great report of what uh, God's been doing here uh, last year, and uh, and really what God, where God wants to take us uh, in the future. Take your bulletin. Uh, wave it at me. <clears throat> Someone asked me where where Sue got this picture, or where this picture came from. Uh, Seventeen below in the garage. Uh, freezing bulb or bubbles so that's where that that came from she's out there all bundled up I'm inside drinking coffee with the space heater on so that's how I helped her get that um, there is a sign up sheet for the winter fun night um, I know we're looking into March but that's going to be just around the corner uh, so if you would uh, sign up for that that's Friday uh, March 15th 630 um, the adults will be down here uh, having a good time. The kids, uh, all of the children, will be at the parsonage um, driving too crazy. But uh, no, we'll be there together, and uh, there'll be a time for the kids to enjoy. We'll have a movie and, uh, and uh, a lot of sugar for them. There's still time for the Financial Peace University, if you'd like to, to sign up for that. Um, we had our first Zoom chat Thursday night, and that went really well, and we have... Um, Appreciate those that are involved in that. If you're interested in that, talk to me after the service today. And um, also there's, uh, there was one other thing. Oh, the Bible's for Mozambique. Um, I'd like to report that we have collected so far a uh, little over $1,700 uh, for Bibles. And I, I shared that information with Gerald Steele, who is uh, the, uh, he's our, kind of our Mozambique guy, and he was uh, overjoyed and kind of blown away. Uh, so we, we put that in there for one more week. If you would like to donate towards that, um, you can use an envelope and just write Bibles for Mozambique. If you'd like to put a, even a portion of that of, of, from a check, you could write in the memo, uh, you know, $10 towards two Bibles or whatever like that, and, and we'll get that to them. Um, we want to get that money sent off to him so we can uh, work towards getting those Bibles to, to Mozambique. He's still working at uh, getting 20,000 Bibles uh, for the pastors in Mozambique because uh, God's just opening up the heavens in that country and uh, people are coming to the Lord. So we want to make sure you, that you uh, have an opportunity to do that. Uh, at this time, uh, one of the things uh, we're, uh, we're trying to do every month is to give an opportunity for you to, to, for, to highlight the OCC, the Christmas shoebox, because uh, Christmas is just around the corner. And uh, uh, it'll be here before you know it. Uh, and that, this year it lands on the 25th of December. So just so none of you are taken by surprise when that, when that happens. But every month we're highlighting some different things for you to, to, uh, to give towards the Operation uh, Shoebox. And you see that in, the, uh, in your bulletin there. Uh, the things for February, um, hygiene items, combs, brushes, toothbrush, hair ties, uh, character bandages and so forth. So uh, those are the things that we're looking for. But we'd also like to share um, a video this morning that shares a little bit of the story of uh, of the shoebox. Thank you. 
Ma meilleure verset, c'est Genèse 1, verset 27. Dieu créa l'homme à son image. Il le créa à l'image de Dieu. Il créa l'homme et la femme. Comme je ne vois pas aussi, je suis à l'image de Dieu. Je m'appelle Josephine. J'ai 12 ans. J'ai trouvé le bébé dans la boîte, ça m'a donné beaucoup de joie. Et les enfants étaient tellement contents, malgré qu'ils ne voyaient pas les choses, ils touchaient, ils demandaient ça c'est quoi, ça c'est quoi, et ils sautaient de joie. Ils se sentaient aimés. Nous les avons demandé après la distribution, ceux qui veulent et faire le PGV. Tous était d'accord pour suivre le, les cours de PGV. Ce que j'ai appris dans la classe de PGV, c'est que Dieu est puissant. C'est lui qui nous donne la vie, il nous, il nous conduit. J'ai appris de Jésus-Christ que c'est lui qui a pris nos péchés et... et il est mort sur la croix pour, pour nos péchés. On a terminé la leçon de PGV. C'est de là que j'ai reçu Jésus. C'est lui qui nous nourrit chaque matin, chaque soir. Again, just an opportunity for you to see where the impact, the eternal impact that the Christmas shoebox can have on a young girl, on a school for the blind that uh, they want to know about Jesus. So we appreciate that. Uh, I love the, <coughs> the corner back here where it says pray big, think big, pack big, and how many boxes we, uh, our goal for this year. And... Um, I was going to say, we could probably uh, double that. Just That would be the challenge before us. Instead of 350, it would be 700. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, CPAs. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> we want to wait upon you for your morning ties and offerings. Uh, so if the ushers would uh, pray themselves. And worship team, if you come... Um, Again, we want to worship as we, as we worship. We worship in giving and we worship in song. And so we get to do this uh, together. Let's pray. Lord, we, we're humbled to think that um, just packing a, a shoebox with some uh, toys and items and um, maybe a note or two uh, to a child on the other side of the world would, would have such an impact. Lord, that it, it seems like it's, it would be so easy for us to do that. And yet, Lord, you use uh, just that, that little bit uh, of intention of bringing about uh, eternal changes in people's lives, and we thank you so much for that. So we pray um, as, we, as we consider that, Lord, that you would uh, bless those efforts, uh, bless those boxes. Lord, for eternity. And we thank you, Lord, that we can also be able to, to help bring Bibles to, to Mozambique. Or just, again, the opportunity that uh, uh, a small church in, in the Thumb of Michigan can, can have eternal impact around the world. What a great privilege and honor to do that for your glory and for your praise. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to continue to worship together. I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died and rose again. I believe he paid for us all. Power to you now, and the grace 
to forgive. I believe in you, Lord. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again. I believe you paid for us all. And I believe you are here. Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah. 
praise offering this morning. All our hope. You are beautiful beyond description to marvelous Majesty and throne of love, and I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe. Beautiful beyond description, yet God crushed you for my sin. In agony and deep affliction, cut off that I might enter in. Who can grasp such tender compassion? Who can fathom this mercy so free? You are beautiful beyond description. Lamb of God who died for me. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. stand in awe of you, and I stand, I stand in awe of you, I stand, I stand in awe of you, holy God to whom all praise is due, I stand. Come today, there's no reason to wait. 
Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior is it He Christ, oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. Lord, what a treasure. The priceless blood shed for us that our forgiveness, our salvation, our eternal life was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That we have that free gift. There's no strings attached. We don't have to clean up our act. We don't have to perform. We don't have to jump through hoops. We just have to come to the altar. Just to come where, where you are, Jesus. Just to turn and cry out to him. He died to have that relationship with you and with me. How precious. How beautiful. We are in awe of Jesus, our Messiah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father God. For who we are in you and who you are to us. Praise you, Lord. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I believe the, uh, the children can be dismissed for junior church. joy when the family of God can come together and, uh, and worship and, and sing and uh, <clears throat> when, uh, when yesterday morning looking at the weather uh, report for, uh, for this morning and realizing that we may have experienced some freezing rain and I know that last night was a little dicey for some people out on the road and uh, I thought, well, with the, with the new technology, I could probably get in this morning if no one else could, and I'd just turn the camera on and you guys could all sit at home and watch the live stream. But then I thought about it, I said, they might get used to that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, um, but praise the Lord, things were, uh, <clears throat> were pretty good this morning. And uh, because it is great to, to actually come together and worship. We come together and, and uh, praise the Lord corporately. There's something unique about that and just an opportunity to, um, to share and to talk. And um, I had to kind of corral my Sunday school class this morning because they were pretty chatty. And, and I think because we're all, we were all kind of hibernating this last week, nobody really got to talk to each other. So, um, so that's okay. But um, we're continuing our study and uh, uh, talking about the family. And today we're going to talk... Uh, about this idea of love. And this goes way, way beyond uh, marriage and our relationship with our, with our spouse. It really, it, it certainly is in every fabric uh, of our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with the, with the body of Christ. Um, and I think that, uh, that over the years, it seems like the, uh, the world or our culture has, has come up with what they think love is. So I want to do a little, um, a little research this morning. I want you to, to give me a name of a song that talks about love. Love, love, love. What's love got to do? I'm not going to ask anyone to sing it, okay? Although, Patty, you know, Melissa, you can get up here and do a duet on that. Uh, what else? Can't buy me love. Love me tender. Oh, yeah. L is for the way you look. I love that song. My, that was on my mom's video. So, my, How deep the Father's love. Love stinks. Okay, Doug, appreciate that perspective. Would you sing? No, never mind. <laughs> What'd you say? You got some up here? Oh, I, I just heard you talking, so I thought maybe you were actually responding to my question, Casey. I was saying love stinks, but you got it. Okay. <laughs> what else? Puppy love. Okay. What else we got? What is love? That's a good song. Muskrat love. Oh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Puppy love, muskrat love, other forms of animal. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I am looking forward to that day. I told Sue already that, that uh, she's going to have to sing that song, or I'm going to sing that song to her. Will you still love? Uh, what's that? Love the way you lie. Love the way you lie, okay? What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Love is blindness, but I have a, a U2. 
Love is blindness, okay? By you too. <clears throat> All right, anyone else? What's that? First John 4, 7, 8. Beloved, let us love one another. Okay, good. Is that it? What's that? <laughs> Tainted love. Okay. I knew I was in trouble. When it was, yeah, let's get some of these. Uh, you know the one I didn't hear? Jesus loves me? Come on. What was that one? Crazy little thing called love. Okay. <clears throat> That's right. I got that. Yes. Anything else? Any any other? What's that? Not just another love song. Okay. Yep. For God so loved the world. It's a great song. Yeah. Jesus loves the little children. All right. So we have we have kind of a a, a wide range, obviously. <laughs> From love stinks to uh, Jesus loves the little children. I think that kind of covers both spectrums of it. Um, what I want to what I want to share with you this morning is is really um, not only what the scriptures has to say about about love, but how how do we love? What is it that that motivates us to love? And and certainly in the relationship when we talk about the the family. Um, we know that uh, that divorce really uh, it it does affect probably almost everyone in this room would know of someone uh, who has been divorced and or has been um, maybe a part of part of that maybe in, in your own life or, or certainly in your family and thinking about this idea of love and the idea that that uh, especially when uh, if I'm in a counseling situation where I hear a person say, well, I don't love that person anymore. What they're really saying is I don't feel that love uh, anymore. I, I don't feel that love. And um, one of the things that just struck me is when we talked last, uh, two weeks ago about the whole marriage thing out of the Ephesians chapter five, that this idea that, that husbands were to love uh, our wives like Christ loved the church, and the, the fact of the matter is you never see in Scripture where it says that Jesus fell in love with the church. It said he loved the church and gave himself up for her. And that there's this, this love, this not only a decision, but there's something deep within, within Christ that, <clears throat> that motivates him to love, to show that love to demonstrate that love. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. The, that we, uh, as people of God, who have been commanded by God, to what? To love one another. That's not a suggestion. That's not, a, you know, if, if, if they are okay, if, you know, if they look okay, if they smell okay, if they dress okay, then love one another. But he makes this, this command to us. He says, love one another. And the cool thing about that, folks, is that he doesn't give us a command and say, oh, you're on your own. You know, I'm going to command you to love one another, but you know what? You're just on your own. I'm not going to help. <laughs> but he says, I, 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 love, I want you to love one another, and, and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit I'm going to give you the spirit of God living in you so that you can accomplish what I tell you to do. So you can accomplish this thing called love. And so as we, as we think about this, we want to think about it in the relationship with the family as we love one another and we, we love um, our spouses. But I also want us to understand that in the wider spectrum of that we are to love one another as Christ loves us. There was a group of children that were asked, uh, why do people fall in love? One eight-year-old answered this way. He says, I think you're supposed to get shot with an arrow or something, but the rest of it isn't supposed to be so f painful. <laughs> hmm. Seven-year-old responded this way. says, 
it isn't always just how you look. Look at me. I'm handsome like anything, and I haven't got anybody to marry me yet. <laughs> a seven-year-old. So when we, when we think about love, we, uh, sometimes even our children are a little, uh, don't quite understand it. But our text today, and you may have guessed it, 1 Corinthians 13. If you want to turn there this morning. 1 Corinthians 13. And I, I certainly use this, this context uh, in this text um, when I officiate marriage because I, a wedding because I believe that it's, it's so crucial to us and it, it gives us that, that, that design by God on how we're supposed to love. You know, in Ephesians 5, it says that, the, that God's design for marriage is, is this way. As the, <clears throat> the wife submits to the husband and the husband loves the wife like Christ loved the church and, and the wife respects the husband, that there's this design that God has put in place for us to, to look at, the example of that. And so when, when Paul is writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I think he's understanding not only from a perspective of marriage, but how we, as believers, are supposed to act and how we're supposed to love. I believe that, that true love, that this kind of love, can triumph over anything in a marriage. That it can, it can accomplish anything. It can go beyond anything else. Because the simple fact is that if I love Sue like Christ loves the church, and I sacrifice for her, the response that she is going to give me is that respect and that submission, that it's actually going to work. God, God sets that formula up and he says, this is how it's going to work. You know, if you put these two pieces together, it's going to function. And I want you to understand this too this morning because um, there's a lot of stats out there that talk about the number of divorce in, in, in the Christian in, inside the church is about the same as outside the church. I, I, wanna, I want you to understand that that's, that's not exactly accurate. And what's happened is, is that we've, we've, we've kind of set this, this bar very low when we talk about people getting divorced who are religious, but not Christian. That when a, person, when, a, when a person is a follower of Christ, that there is, there is a low percentage of divorce in those families. And I say this because I want you to understand that, that there's hope. That, that marriage is a good thing in, inside the, the Christian life. That God has blessed that, he's ordained that. It's an example of his relationship with the church. And that it works. And that we don't have to be afraid that, oh, you know, uh, we're just like the world, and the world is 50% divorce rate or 60% divorce rate, and obviously that's what the same as Christians. No. I want you to understand that, that God has redeemed the marriage, and he wants to redeem the family. And I know, as a, as a product of a divorce home, that he can redeem families, that he can redeem people. So I, I want you to be encouraged by that. But the first thing I want you to look at this morning is that true love, and, and I, I really hesitated. I didn't want to, to get into Princess Bride uh, vernacular. So I'm, I'm just going to, you know, after almost 63 years, I'm going to be mature. And I'm not, so true love... <laughs> True love, number one. True love gives without expecting anything in return. Look at our, ver our chapter uh, 13 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 13. It says this. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge... I have a faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Paul is pointing to, the, to these gifts that the Corinthian church <clears throat> felt were, were the good things. The gifts of tongue, the gift of prophecy and revelation, the gift of faith and the gift of material possessions. This is what the Corinthian church thought was, was prominent. That if we have these things, we're, we're going to be good. We're, we're a good church. And the city of Corinth was, was kind of like the crossroads of, of all these different nations coming together. Somebody referred to it as, as kind of like Hong Kong, where, where everything came together to go to, to Asia. You know, Hong Kong was the, was the place where everything came together. And Corinth was kind of like that. And so there was a lot of things going on in that city. And what Paul is trying to get them to understand is that it doesn't matter if you give yourself away. It doesn't matter if you give everything away. It doesn't matter if you speak in tongues. It doesn't matter if you speak in, in angelic voices. It doesn't matter if you have prophecy. None of that matters without love. None of that matters. If you don't have love, it doesn't matter how spiritual you are or think you are. <laughs> That's cutting right to the quick. Saying if you don't have love, if you don't have this true love, it doesn't matter what you do. So true love gives. In fact, God is the, is the ultimate giver. In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, true love gives. This, the Greek word in the New Testament is agape, which means unconditional love. Unconditional, which means I'm going to love without expecting anything in return. It's unconditional you know what unconditional means? Thank you. Unconditional means... Un so if you have an unconditional guarantee, what does that mean? It's unconditional. There's no condition where it's not unconditional. <laughs> Sorry. It's unconditional love. God says, I'm going to love. And, and I want you to grasp this for a moment. You realize that if, if, you, if you were the only person on earth that received Christ, if you were the only person of the billions and billions and billions of, of people that have lived on the earth or ever will, if you were the only person to receive Christ, he still would have went to the cross. he still would have went to the cross. That verse still would be true, that God so loved the world that he gave. So in our experience, <clears throat> we love unconditionally. Now here's, here's the kicker, and here's the caveat on this, that, that the only way that we can love unconditionally, <clears throat> excuse me, The only way that we can love unconditionally is if we've experienced that unconditional love in our life. See, you can't love <clears throat> like you're supposed to love without Jesus. We can't do that. We can't love. In 1 John 4.19, we uh, studied 1 John for a long time. We love because God first loved us. The principle here is that love must first be received before it can be given. And you can only give to the degree that you have received. See, children, when they experience unconditional love, they have a reservoir of love. That they are able to love from that. When parents give conditional love, 
That's how the children are going to love. <clears throat> so one author called it the love bank. You put money in the bank and you draw it out. When our children experience that kind of love from us, they put that in the bank. That's that reservoir, that's that love that, so that they can love other people. God loves us, we can put that in the bank. We can take that to the bank. God loves us so that I can love. The problem is when my, when my tank is empty, it's really hard to show that love to other people. You can't do it. What happens when, <clears throat> when we demand certain things for uh, us to love our kids or to love other people? For instance, you may say, I love you if you get good grades. I love you if you clean the house. Back to that first one, my mom would never love me if that were the case. So just, but she did, even as a teacher. I love you if you clean the house. I love you if you make me feel intelligent, special, or wanted. You see, that kind of love is conditional. And when we do have that kind of love shown to us, it's conditional love that we give. Sometimes we try to fill that bank with other things. With drugs, alcohol, sex outside of marriage, risky behavior, codependent relationships, anything else that will temporarily fill that painful emptiness of that love bank. What kind of love are you giving your spouse and children? <clears throat> What kind of love do you have in the love bank? Are you going to that bank? Are you asking Christ to fill that? See, in Romans 5, 8, Paul writes this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated unconditional love for you and for me so that we can show that to other people. So when Jesus tells us, <clears throat> through the scriptures to love our enemies <clears throat> we look at that and we go that's how do I do that Jesus said while you were still sinners I died for you while you were still my enemies I died for you while you were still against me I showed unconditional love to you I think that the greatest aspect of the Christian life that is supernatural is when we can say and we can demonstrate love for our enemies. That's huge. Because it's easy to love those people that are lovable. Sometimes. But do we love like Christ loves us? Do we love unconditionally? The second thing we see here is that true love, a true love acts to bring out the best in others. Look at verses four through seven. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Paul doesn't, doesn't share these or describe these loves as feelings. These are actions. Now, certainly love is, is emotional. We have, we have the, the emotions of love. God was an emotional God, and he loved emotionally. But in the choices that we make, in the, the idea of loving unconditionally and showing love is an act, is a choice that we make. So listen to this. Verse 4, love is patient. Now, I don't know if you, any of you want to take, you know, any kind of a self-exam here, so we'll just leave it at that. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. 
Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So how'd you do? Or maybe you didn't do anything with it. So here's your, here's your assignment <clears throat> for the next 30 seconds. Anywhere where it says love, I want you to put your name in there. So while I read it, you put your name in there, okay? Reggie is patient. Reggie is kind. Reggie does not envy. Reggie does not boast. Reggie is not proud. Reggie is not rude. Reggie is not self-seeking. Reggie is not easily, 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 easily angered. Reggie keeps no record of wrongs. Reggie does not delight in evil, but Reggie rejoices with the truth. Reggie always protects. Reggie always trusts. Reggie always hopes. Reggie always perseveres. How'd you do? <laughs> you see, God gives us a standard. He gives us a design of what it's supposed to be like in a relationship. Not only with a, the with a spouse, but with other people. Because as, as, we, as we do this, as we seek to, to allow these things in our lives, it brings out the best in other people. It, it, it allows them to experience those same kind of things. It allows them to say, yes, okay, Reggie's patient. I should be patient. I have that capability of, of being patient. Reggie doesn't keep any record of wrong. <laughs> they call that the ledger syndrome. You ever get in a fight? Where in the middle of that, in the middle of the heat, it's like all of a sudden this big ledger comes out. Well, you remember back in May of 2002? On the 2nd of May, do you remember what you said to me? Maybe that's happened to you. And then we'll go to the next day. Look what you did. Look what you said. And then your opponent pulls out their ledger. Well, yeah, you think that's bad. Look at this. You see what love says? You don't keep a ledger. You don't keep account. So when we, folks, this is huge because when we start talking in, about in the church, <laughs> when we expand this beyond the family into the church, when there are people that attend on a Sunday morning, that they'll admit that I haven't talked to that person in 30 years because I'm so ticked at them of what they did 30 years ago. That I, I'll never talk to that person. What? Yeah, I, I remember when they were kids. <laughs> and so, some of you, I know, you've been around long. I, I remember when they were kids. I remember what they did. Now, I've heard that about Joel, but that was from his mom. So I'm just, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but do, do we understand the significance of that, though? Because we want to bring out the best in others. We don't want to bring out the worst. We want to be in a place where, where these are characteristics of, of my life. That people would say, yeah, that, that Reggie, he is one of these things I want that demonstrated in my life 
And that can only happen when I have that full tank. When I receive that love from Christ, and I, I want to be a conduit, I want to, I want to be that hose that, that, just, that has the opportunity to, to spread out God's love. Allow people to be better. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote this. It says, Do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. I think the point of this is that the, the key for me is when I start praying for someone that I don't like, God changes my heart. And I don't pray that God will get them. <laughs> okay, sometimes, <laughs> typically, I don't pray that God will get them. But when you start loving your enemies and say, God, would you bless them? When you've discovered this, that someone is, has hurt you deeply and you begin to pray that God will bless them, that God will encourage them, that God will reveal himself to them, it changes our hearts. So when we get ticked at our neighbors, we pray for them. Number three, true love outlasts everything else. Verse eight, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know, I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. But now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Someone wrote this, it is natural to love them that love us, but it is supernatural to love them that hate us. Love at first sight is easy to understand. It's when two people have been looking at each other for years and it becomes, it's when two people have been looking at each other for years that it becomes a miracle. <laughs> True love is supernatural because God is the one who gives it to us. And we, in turn, can give true love to others, including our spouse. Someone wrote this, A song is not a song until you sing it. A bell is not a bell until you ring it. And love is not love until you give it away. Do we love like Christ loves us? You have to receive it from God and give it away. It's the story of a, of a millionaire who went broke, he went bankrupt. And uh, he was asked this question, he says, do you ever regret having given millions of dollars to support the work of Christ? He replied, no, the only money I didn't lose is the money I gave away. We can apply that to our love. Do we give it away? We'll never regret giving our love to people because love never fails. 
Love is eternal. We love our spouse because Christ loved us. We love our church family because Christ loved us. And we love our enemies because Christ loved us. Let's pray. Lord, as we just process this, what you've shared with us today, Lord, and the characteristics of love, this idea of, of loving like you loved us, and, and out of that fullness that you've given us, a demonstration of your love for us that we can demonstrate love for others, certainly including our spouse, our family, our kids. Lord, I pray that the families today would, would experience a, a deeper, richer love that they've ever experienced before, that they would love their children in such a way that those kids would know that the daddy and mommy love them because Jesus loves them. And Lord, in those, in those hard spots, in those places where it's so difficult to love, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you, you give us that ability supernaturally. And it isn't just a, a, an act of the will, but it's out of response. It's out of gratitude because of the love that has been lavished on us that we in turn love others. Give us that kind of love that the world would know that we are your disciples because we love one another. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you stand with us as we sing our closing song? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength in pain is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. Paid it all, all 
to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left the crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And all God's people said, thank God. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.